Yeah, good morning and uh, welcome to this early nine o'clock session today after a JNAC party. So good to see some people here. My name is uh, Frederik, so I'm a field technician in the Jamf Amsterdam office in the Netherlands. Um, I joined Jamf in January, so it's actually my first year at Jamf and my first JNOC, so that's awesome. Um, we're going to talk about distribution points today and just to set some expectations right for this session uh, this morning. What I'm not going to do is going into details on the specific configuration of the distribution point itself, server side. That would actually bring us a little bit too far along the road and keep us here for a few hours, I guess. But what I'm going to try to do is go through a journey of different, all the considerations that you actually have to make uh, when you're planning your strategy for deploying content to your Apple devices. So that basically brings us back to a few questions uh, that we will have to ask ourselves. So first of all, why do we need distribution points? What type of distribution points are actually compatible with Jamf Pro? What type of distribution point will be best for your environment? And then we'll have a look at how to configure some things in Jamf Pro itself. So yeah, first of all, why do we need distribution points? And let's see, first of all, for iOS. So as we all know, if you look at iOS, quite a closed system. So most of the content that you will be deploying will actually come from Apple itself. So applications from the App or, uh, App or VPP store, uh, iBooks from the eBook store, and all the software updates all coming directly from one or another uh, Apple server. But for those who are deploying in-house contents, such as applications and eBooks, you might want to have some location to actually store those and push those out to your devices. Which means that for those amongst you who are only managing iOS devices and not planning to deploy any in-house content, you might not, want, or might not need a distribution point at all, and you might actually be in the wrong session this morning. But, Fortunately for macOS, we can deploy a lot more, and that's where things get a little bit more complicated. So we obviously have all the content that comes from Apple directly. We have in-house content to uh, deploy to our devices. But on top of that, we have all the type of packages, software, scripts, and yes, imaging. Um, you can see that I mentioned imaging a few times along the slides. I'm gonna try to ignore that as long as possible. Um, but yeah, I will come back to it at a certain moment. So yeah, uh, before we actually make a decision on what type of distribution point you will be using, uh, let's see what is actually compatible with Jamf Pro. So for those using Jamf Cloud, as part of this subscription with Jamf, you have access to the GCDS, or the Jamf Cloud Distribution Server, which basically gives you an unlimited storage point for all the content that you might want to deploy. For those who are not using Jamf Cloud and still want to use a cloud service, you can integrate it Akamai, AWS, and Rackspace. But on top of that, fortunately, we can also choose for a local fascia distribution point over SMB or HTTP. And I kind of uh, admi uh, omitted to put AFP in, uh, on the slide. I think when I was making the slide, I was already in the mood of upgrading my Mac to uh, High Sierra. Because with the, uh, as we know, with the uh, launch of APFS, we kind of got rid of support of AFP. But for those who are still managing an environment where you still have devices that, for one reason or another, are not upgrading immediately to Mac, uh, 10 .13, Mac OS 10.13, uh, you might still be using AFP in your environment. So, two types of uh, distribution points, cloud, whether or not it is JCDS, and local file share. And in order to make a decision on what type of distribution point is actually best for your environment, um, there are a lot of considerations that you will have to make uh, when making that decision for your organization. Are you only managing one location, or do you have remote offices? Do you have roaming users that go from one location to another, leave your, external, of your internal network, connect to public Wi-Fi, et cetera? Imaging again, and what about FPFS? Some considerations on performance and uh, failover, in-house content and scripts, and maybe last but not least, um, yeah, maybe for smaller um, organizations, not as straightforward as we would think, do you have extra servers available, servers available 
to actually spin up an extra distribution point or not. So let's see what we can discuss on what type of distribution point will actually be best for your environment. A good point to start, like a lot of things, is the manual. So if you look at our administrator guide, there is a nice section on uh, about distribution points where you find all the different features and compatibility. And one thing I want to highlight here is that you can actually have unlimited amount of file share distribution points or local file share distribution points in your Jump Pro server, but you can only configure one cloud distribution point. So one uh, first consideration that you want to take into account. Um, a lot of information in this overview. There used to be a third column, which I nicely removed from the picture, which was GCDS. But yeah, we only have file share, uh, local file share and cloud at the moment. So let's have a look at some pro and cons and compare um, cloud distribution points with what we can do with local file shares. I'm going to focus on cloud because for the elements that I'm going to highlight, cloud and local uh, pro and cons are actually quite the opposite. So yeah, due to the nature of a cloud distribution point, which is hosted outside of your, of your internal network, it should be kind of public. And wherever your uh, devices are, they should technically be uh, able to connect and download the content that you make available for them. But on the other hand, because of the fact that it is outside of your network, all the content, even if your devices are inside your network, will be downloading everything from the internet through your network, and that might be creating some bandwidth and traffic. So depending the devices that you are, uh, the number of devices that you are uh, managing, the type of contact, uh, content, the size of your packages, etc., you might want to prefer um, an internal SharePoint if yeah, most of your users are going to be internal anyway. On the other hand, because you're using uh, a third party or uh, GCDS to do that cloud distribution point, you actually don't need an extra server. So for smaller organizations, that will bring the costs down, avoid you to uh, do extra maintenance, and even backups should be uh, part of the subscription with your cloud solution. Imaging, well, just to mention it, um, for those who are still in the mood of doing imaging, um, you will need a local file share because Casper Imaging will not work with a cloud distribution point. But we'll come back to that later. In-house content, and that's mainly for those who are managing iOS, I guess. Um, just remember, if you're, manage, if you're, if you're planning to deploy in-house applications, you'll definitely need a cloud solution. I put no scripts on the cloud, which is technically not really correct, but what I mean with it is that if you're only using a cloud distribution point and you want to deploy scripts to your, uh, to your Macs, then the scripts will actually be stored inside the database of Jamf Pro and not on the actual cloud distribution point itself. If you're using a local file share, you can put the scripts in the form of a file on your local distribution point. Just something to remember for those who want to keep their database nice and tiny. Um, selective replication, I'm going to come back to that at the end of the uh, session. But as from the moment you have multiple distribution points, you will, of course, need to copy all the content across all the distribution points that you actually deployed. And one thing we can do is select what type of uh, files will actually be copied to another distribution point. The only thing to remember here that is it's only working from a local file share towards the cloud and not the other way around. And then finally, failover. Um, depending your organization and depending the uh, potential uh, impact on your business and your end users, you might want to have an extra distribution point for uh, in case something happens to the primary one. One thing to remember here is that a cloud distribution point cannot be set as a failover for a local file share, and you can actually not select a failover for your cloud distribution point either. So a lot of considerations, but I think it's a good start to plan ahead and see what, in what direction you will be going for your uh, environment. I try to avoid it 
uh, as long as possible, but yeah, uh, to get rid of the uh, discussion on imaging. When I do jump starts and people mention that they want to do uh, imaging, we always end up in a discussion on yeah, why what, do you want, really want to do that and do you actually still need it. Sometimes I win a discussion. There are rare occasions where I don't. But yeah, thanks to macOS High Sierra, I'm pretty sure I will win more of those discussions as from tomorrow. Um, but yeah, for those rare occasions where I won't win the discussion uh, and you will still yeah, you, want, you still want to do imaging. Um, just remember, it's only with a local file share, or even worse, maybe a local folder um, that you link to Casper Imaging. So no cloud distribution points. Taking everything into consideration, um, let's start with a very simple, straightforward situation. You're only, you only have one location and only on-site users. So for instance, you're only uh, managing IMAX which are most likely going to stay in your organization or within your uh, internal network. Um, cloud or local, uh, if you're only managing uh, internal devices, you're most likely going to end up with a local file share. But on top of that, and on top of all the considerations that we had in the previous slides, uh, you might want to think about performance and failover. Depending the amount of devices, the frequency at which they're going to uh, download large packages, etc., you might want to have extra distribution points to actually spread the load on your servers and yeah, give your end users a nice experience uh, across the deployment of your uh, policies, etc. Something that will depend on the size of your organization and the experience you have with what type of uh, frequency will be triggered as um, yeah, users are downloading these things. Failover, again, so even if you made the choice between cloud or local, consider to have additional fast share distribution points in case something happens. And everything will actually fall down to how your network is actually organized. One distribution point per subnet, uh, maybe some extra for failover, etc. So you might end up having um, multiple distribution points, and even a uh, combination with cloud and local, like we're going to see later. If you manage multiple locations, then you'll definitely be thinking about multiple uh, distribution points. Um, even if your network is uh, connected one way or another over one or a VPN. And that will actually bring us to uh, a big discussion on replication that we're going to see at the end of the session. Um, because due to the remote uh, locations, you will actually fi have to find the most efficient way of copying your content from one distribution point to another. But I leave that discussion to the end of this uh, session. And then finally, roaming users, that's where things will become a bit more tricky. Uh, because if you have users with MacBooks, they will go from one meeting to another, uh, go from one office to another, even go and work from home, uh, connect to public wi fi et cetera. So you'll have to think about how are those users going to get access to the content that you make available in your distribution points. If you're only using a cloud solution, that's going to be straightforward. They, whatever they are, they should be able to uh, download the packages. But that brings us back then what you, uh, to discussion on the, on the traffic and uh, bandwidth, if they are inside. But most likely, you will want a situation where if they are inside your network, they are directed to the internal distribution point. And when they are outside, your, of, outside of one of your internal, distribution, of, uh, internal networks, uh, you point them to some kind of a cloud solution. Then there are some crazy uh, or creative uh, solutions that you see from time to time where you actually give access to your firewall, which I'm not too fan of. Before we continue the whole discussion, just let's have a look at uh, some basic settings that we have to do in Jamf Pro. So to set up a cloud distribution point, for those using Jamf Cloud, that's actually quite straightforward. You go to the settings of Jamf Pro, you select Cloud Distribution Point, choose Jamf Cloud, and you hit Save. Nothing else to do. Uh, everything is taken care of. You can make it your uh, master distribution point. And if you want to do selective replication, that's an option 
as well for cloud. If you use uh, Rackspace, AWS, or Akamai, you will, of course, need some additional configuration, some additional information to actually make the connection. For local file shares, um, well, first of all, you will give it an internal reference name. You put in the host name and the IP address. Um, select whether or not it's going to be your master. And select a failover for this specific um, distribution point that you are configuring. But we'll have a look at that later as well. Second tab will be uh, selection of the protocols, so SMB or AFP. Uh, the, sh the share name, whether or not you're using a workgroup or a domain. And then we need two user accounts. By preference, some service accounts. One way to read only access to your distribution point, to your file share, and another one with read and write. The idea behind it is when you're using Casper Admin, it will actually use the uh, read and write account to upload content to your distribution point. And the end users that are going to download it through a policy are going to be using the read-only account. And then we have the option to uh, enable uh, HTTP. Um, maybe two main reasons why you want to do that. First one will be performance. Downloads will actually go a bit faster than SMB. But then the most important uh, reason, I think, uh, will be resumable downloads. So if you're using or if you're managing uh, MacBooks and you have end users going from one, of, uh, from one meeting to the other, going home, closing the lid of their MacBook in uh, the middle of uh, a deployment, with SMB it would actually kill the download and it will have to start over. With HTTP you will be able to do um, resumable downloads and that's a bit more efficient way of doing things. Then, whenever you have made up your mind on the type of distribution points that you will be using, how much uh, across your organization, etc., you will have to find a way of pointing your end users towards the nearest and most efficient distribution point. And let's have a look at how we do that or how that's done in Java Pro. If you have a look at policies and you configure the package payload, by default, it will say uh, each computer's default distribution point. But you have the option to select a specific distribution point for this specific policy. So if you, use, if you add multiple packages in the same policy, the settings for the distribution point will actually be the same for all the packages that you are configuring, which makes sense. So you can point it to a specific local file share or, uh, if needed, to your cloud distribution point. But what do we mean with uh, each computer uh, default distribution point? Well, if you only have one distribution point configured, that's most likely going to be your master. And if needed, and if you have one configured, redirect it to your failover. So when we set up distribution points and local file shares in Jamf Pro, the idea is that you will first configure your failover distribution point, which will then be available to select on the left on the one that's going to be the primary one. Um, if you didn't do the failover first, then you can just save the distribution point, of course, and edit it later. One thing to point out again on uh, cloud distribution points, whether or not you select it as your master, doesn't change anything. You can't select a failover and you can't select the cloud distribution point as a failover for um, a local file share either. But instead of pointing your um, end users or your, your Macs uh, directly through a specific um, uh, distribution point or the cloud, uh, you can actually play with network segments to define that computer's default distribution point. So in the settings of Jamf Pro uh, network segments, you can define an IP range and select the distribution point that all the Macs who are of which are in that specific IP range should use. Um, quite handy if you have multiple locations, managing multiple subnets, etc., to be sure that the Mac will actually try to download the content from the nearest uh, distribution point. 
And a very handy thing we can actually do when we look back at uh, roaming users is to play a little trick with two different uh, IP ranges that will point our end users to the cloud distribution point when they are outside of your internal network and to the ins internal distribution point when they are inside. By doing that on the right side, we take a large IP range going from 1 to 255, which should basically encompass all the situations where your user might be in. But then we create a second uh, network segment where we define the specific range of our um, internal network. And the way Jamf Pro will actually uh, work is that it will put the, um, the Mac in both segments, but the one it's going to be using for the configuration is going to be the most restrictive one. And there is, if I look at Jamstart and a lot of discussions on Jamf Nation, there is some confusion about what does it mean, the most restrictive one. And it's actually not because 192 from 1 to 100 is part of the other network segment that is going to use that one. The idea behind it is it's going to use the network segment with the least amount of IP addresses. So it's not because the left one is part of the right one. It's because there are less IP addresses in the left one than there are in the other uh, network segment. And on top of that, if a Mac would be a member of two network segments with an equal amount of IP ranges, of IP addresses, then in that case, the GSS, or sorry, Jam Pro server, will actually take the network segment where the starting IP address starts with the lowest number. So if I have two IP, address, uh, two IP ranges with 10 IP addresses in it, and one is starting with 172 and the other one with 192, it will actually take the 172 uh, network segment and point the MAC to that specific distribution point. Just to highlight the fact that there was, there was some discussions on Jamf Nation that I saw in the past. So most likely, if you are going to manage multiple uh, locations uh, with roaming users, you will want to uh, create something like this to make sure that your end users have access to their content. And that actually brings us to replication. So first of all, the tool within Jamf Pro is Casper Admin. A few things to highlight there is even if you have HTTP enabled, you will actually fall back to SMB uh, when using Casper Admin and doing replication across your distribution points. And then, like we uh, already mentioned, um, selective replication is only from a local file share towards a cloud and not the other way around. Of course, Casper Admin, SMB, multiple locations, isolated networks might be not the efficient, most efficient way to uh, replicate content to uh, all your distribution points. So you will have to find another way of yeah, copying all that data. And depending the infrastructure that you already have in place, you, will, you might have a preference on how you're going to do that, uh, that replication. And I do apologize in advance to open Pandora's box at the very end of this session because there is so much discussion about it. And I'm not going to go into detail on all the different types of replication methods that you can use. First of all, maybe the lack of experience with a lot of those things. I'm a field tech doing jump starts, not Windows manager of a admin, etc. But I would say have a look at Jamf Nation. There is a lot of discussions going on on this, um, going from manual copying to Windows DFS, etc. A few that I do like is the Resilius Sync, and uh, maybe even the solution with Box.com. So in order to find some additional resources, uh, like I said, have a look at Jamf Nation. Plenty of discussions on there. Obviously, yeah, we have the um, administrator guide. But if you just do a Google search, Jamf replicate distribution points, you will end up with a lot of tech sites handling that uh, discussion, even people or bloggers who are actually here present in Jamf Nation. Um, 
yeah, I'm not going to go into detail on any other uh, aspects of distribution points. Um, that's basically what I wanted to bring today. So if there are people who are replicating with one of those specific uh, methods, I would say come up to the mic and share the experience with your, in with your uh, colleagues here. Um, and apart from that, I'm happy to see if there are any questions about distribution points. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Oh, there we go. Uh, I just wanted to put in a plug for uh, the combination of DFS and IIS. Uh, I've got currently over 190 distribution points and growing worldwide, and uh, it has been really, really fantastic. Um, a bit of custom configuration that you have to do to make sure uh, that IIS uh, looks at it properly, but um, once it's set up, it's really, really nice. Uh, and we're, I mean, we're a giant Windows shop, so all of our, uh, you know, VM, I, of course you can have Linux and VMware, but we have lots of Windows VMs, lots of Windows local distribution points, and uh, we share our local distribution points between SCCM and Jamf. Um, of course, SCCM has its own replication, but we use strictly DFS uh, for cool. Jamf, and, um, yeah, the only challenge is when you get to the kind of, you know, the number of distribution points uh, that we have, um, DFS really only has one schedule for the group. Um, so you can tune it in terms of when it replicates and what speed it replicates at, but um, it can become a little bit challenging when you have some locations that can't handle uh, the bandwidth that your normal replication schedule uh, does. But by and large, it's been very excellent. Cool. Well, oh, thanks for sharing. Yes, hello. Hi. Um, before I sound a little grumpy, I just want to preface that I'm a huge Jamf fan and I've gotten your product into a number of my employers' environments. So uh, take this with a grain of salt. But I, I think it's a little disappointing uh, the level of um, support that that is you're able to do with respect to guiding us as administrators with respect to replication. Mm -hmm. I understand it's a very complex tool and uh, Jamf Nation is a great resource for people going outside of the basic user manual, um, but there's, a, there's a, uh, obviously a spectrum there of what you're able to support and what you're hoping to support in the future. And I would just encourage uh, the consideration that maybe um, there should be m a little bit more out-of-the-box support for these complex methods of replication, because not all of us uh, are, right. are, at that, are operating at the same technical level when it comes to server protocols and things like that. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, you don't uh, sound grumpy at all, so uh, thanks for uh, sharing that. Um, I think that's feedback that is already being processed through Jamf. Um, but yeah, I think the, the, more, the biggest reason behind that is all the different environments um, on which we can do replication and things like that. So that's adding complexity to the whole story. But yeah, it's already feedback that we are here uh, left and right. But thanks for bringing that up again. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, hello. I was wondering. I'm about to embark on the uh, topic you didn't want to talk about, <laughs> setting up the uh, GSS and the DMZ. Yeah. Um, do you recommend branding the URL? Say, like, for example, instead of just leaving it as the name of your server and then, you know, slash uh, the, the, the port number, like g calling it like company name dot jamf pro and then doing it that way. So though it's externally facing, it, it doesn't really look like a server, it looks more like a website. Oh, yeah, I guess so. I don't see really uh, what it would actually change. Uh, you think about security, that they don't try to guess that there is a server behind it, yeah. or, yeah. yeah. I don't know if there are any security experts in the room here who can add something <laughs> to that, but I think that might actually be a, a good, good idea. Um, Maybe the gentleman has something to say. Okay. Uh, we did not customize the distribution point name simply because it appears totally invisible to the end users. Yeah. And there's no reason for it not to be cryptic or more not to follow the standardized server name convention, which doesn't give away any 
information on its functionality. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Meantime, I did actually have a question, or, but you can look. I'll come back. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Hello. Now. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, is there any best practices for the scenario where uh, if the user goes home with their laptop, they can get their stuff from the cloud. When they come back to the office, they get it from the LAN. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, we're doing it using the IP uh, segment. Yeah. But is there a, the scenario also like if the office is using 192.168.1.x, when they go home to their own house, they're still using 192.168.1.x. Therefore, it's trying to get the local distribution point. Yeah, I think Dave can uh, go a bit more into detail. If I'm correct, it's going to do reported IP as well, but let's listen to Dave. Hi, I'm David Ravy. I'm a senior field tech here at Jamf. Uh, so what I would do is I would use the outbound IP, the live IP address, and not the, not the NATed address if you're worried about that sort of double double booking this way you're making sure that you're using only the external IP address for your distribution points and then you're never going to get that kind of crossover. So how, you, how do you control which IP it gets reported? It sees both. Okay. So with a Mac right. computer it's going to see both the external IP address and then the NATed IP address. So it will know both IP addresses. So you can use only the external IP address so that if they're out at home and they're behind a NAT it's going to see both their NATed IP address and the IP address of their, of their router. So you can use that as you're as your live to the internet versus I'm at this location. And is that configured in the network segment? It can it see or the say The network which... segment is going to try off of both IP addresses mm -hmm. and will meet itself to whatever is the most restrictive, as in fewest number of IP addresses. So. Okay. That's what works the best. I, I came from an organization that had 23 uh, different locations, and that's the way we had to do it because we used a very similar uh, network structure inside of each of our locations, so we had to use the uh, routable IP address. Okay. Because yes. if you um, have an IP range with only one IP address in there, so start and end the same, then it's always going to use that one because, yeah, nothing less than one, so if you use the public IP address. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, on network segments, how at any given point is the IP address determined? Is it uh, the IP, the reported IP, or the IP at the last inventory? I guess, is it the client or the server making the determination what to actually use? Uh, well, it's, it's going back in the same discussion there, yeah. apparently, but um, it's actually looking at both. Uh, it's taking care of, of doing some comparison between uh, the reported IP and the one that Jamf Pro is detecting. So it's using both and uh, taking the most restrictive, well, okay. the least IP address because the most restrictive can be network segment rate. Thank you again. Um, yeah. You, you uh, encouraged us to share our solutions that we're using right now. Um, Definitely. We, our security team didn't like uh, a cloud solution, whether it be yours or Akami or, or AWS. So instead, what, what we ended up doing was uh, setting up another JSS instance outside of our DMZ in, in Amazon, but as a Linux <coughs> server. Mm -hmm. And then we poked a hole through our firewall so that they could talk to each other over 8443. And then... Um, set up S, uh, Samba on that Linux instance outside, mm -hmm. and it's, it, it just acts as another SharePoint that we listed as a local. So it's listed in RJSS as a local distribution point, but it's really out, out in uh, AWS as a, a Linux SharePoint. OK. Yeah, thank you. Hey. Hi. More of a feedback slash feature request for better support of overlapping IPs internally. So we have a global organization that's based on mergers and acquisitions. So mm -hmm. we get a lot of companies under our umbrella that have the same IP range network set up internally. And you can't set a distribution point on a network segment for, for the same network segment, right? So if I have okay. a user that's in Denver <clears throat> and with the same IP range. With the same IP range as Atlanta, if that Denver employee goes to Atlanta, they're looking at they're Denver. You, you understand what I'm saying? There's no. Yeah. Um, it's not good support for overlapping network IP ranges where 
um, a user can get to the proper distribution point? Well, you might want to play with the public IP address then again. Maybe. For internal, though, how do you hit a yeah, public IP? Yeah, if you have IP? multiple internal, yeah. Right. Okay, Thanks. well, um, is that already a feature request on JavNation? I don't know. Um, if not, please do, and otherwise it's recorded here, so definitely get some feedback. All right, so this is probably a silly question, but rather than assume, um, cloud distribution points, you said that Jamf admin will default to SMB when it's uploading. If you have your cloud set as your master, does it still use SMB to upload? Not for the cloud. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I was just that, making sure yeah. that cloud was only HTTP and there wasn't some magic behind there that I didn't know about. Yeah, we don't do that level of magic. We do a lot of magic in Jamf, but uh, we can't do that, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, the question up. Uh, what happens at the client level if the distribution point is just not available at that time? Um, well, the policy will fail unless you have a, a failover, and then the policy will actually know that it has to redirect the uh, client to another distribution point. But if the, f uh, the, the distribution point is not available at all, your policy will fail, and you should say, see some error saying, like, yeah, totally there's, failed. There's no way to set, like, OK, distribution point's not available to use the Jamf Cloud to as a distribution point? No, you can't put Jump Cloud as an, uh, of GCDS as a uh, failover for a local file share, um, unfortunately. That is a very popular feature request, though. Yes. Go to Jump Nation, hit the like of the, the vote button. I don't know. Hi. I've got one more, uh, more of kind of a why does it work this way uh, <laughs> request. Um, so we've been seeing some cases where a package will download successfully from the primary distribution point, which has a failover set. Um, mm -hmm. But there is a local uh, failure to install, and then it fails over to the secondary distribution point, grabs the package again, tries to install it again, fails again, and then fails. So I'm not sure if that's the way it's intended to work, but that's the way it, we're seeing it work for us. It's a local, in, like an installer failure, and it doesn't just fail out at that point. It rolls over to the next distribution point, downloads it again, fails again, then kicks out. Well, Dave's already grab, grabbing the mic, but I think mm -hmm. maybe something to do with uh, package integrity or something, I don't know. So that's not a distribution point failure, that's probably an a failure with the installation package. Right. And a failure of the p policy creation because the best practices that we specify should be you cache the package and then install a cached <coughs> package. So I would try that, and that will help you determine whether it's a package integrity issue or if it's a distribution point issue. Package issue yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> so not not a question, but I wanted to give a bit of a workaround about how we fail over to AWS. Okay. Cool. So sorry. So we have um, an Amazon distribution point using CloudFront, and it's in as a cloud distribution point, but it's also in as a file share distribution point, and all of the SMB stuff is nonsense. And then HTTP, it has the CloudFront URL. Yeah. So you can then say, use this on-premise distribution point, or fail over to this file share distribution point that doesn't actually do file sharing, and that works really well. And we push about 200 terabytes a month through CloudFront using exactly that. So people. basically, the whole protocol is nonsense, but yeah, SMB HTTP, says, like, uh, not used. Yeah, in, in seen that before, yeah. Um, you just have to remember that then if you load Casper Imaging or Casper Admin, that you can't replicate to that distribution point. Of course. But it doesn't matter because it's in Amazon. And yeah, cool. that works really well. OK, thank you. Yes, hello. Hello. Um, we use Akamai. And uh, <coughs> currently, when we upload, it uploads via ye old FTP. Are there any plans for modern uploading methods? There weren't last year or the year before. Not that I know of. Um, maybe not. You're not talking to the right person here, but um, I don't have any idea if that's pipeline. Maybe the guy in black who's been answering questions know that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> as a follow-up to the concept of failing over to a cloud, it, as in our case where we uh, set up a, a local distribution point that's actually outside of our network in the AWS, uh, because it's a Linux mm -hmm. server serving up an, an SMB SharePoint, that can be selected as uh, a failover. And so it's okay. actually before yeah. I learned what you taught us just now about the subnet uh, encapsulation, that's how we've been get, making sure that our roaming users can 
you know, they're set up to receive it locally, but of course they can't hit that when they're outside the network and then it fails over to the AWS instance. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks, Frederick. Um, we've got another session starting in about half an hour, tips and tricks in scoping a policy. So hope to see everyone there.